Millard Fillmore was the 13th President of the United States, the last to be a member of the Whig Party while in the White House. A former congressman from New York, Fillmore was elected the nation's 12th Vice President in 1848, and was elevated to the presidency by the death of Zachary Taylor. He was instrumental in getting the Compromise of 1850 passed, a bargain that led to a brief truce in the battle over slavery. He failed to win the Whig nomination for president in 1852. He gained the endorsement of the nativist Know Nothing Party four years later, and finished third in that election. Fillmore was born into poverty in the Finger Lakes area of New York State. His parents were tenant farmers during his formative years. He rose from poverty through study, and became a lawyer though he had little formal schooling. He became prominent in the Buffalo area as an attorney and politician, was elected to the New York Assembly in 1828, and the U.S. House of Representatives in 1832. Initially, he belonged to the Anti-Masonic Party, but became a Whig as the party formed in the mid-1830s. He was a rival for state party leadership with editor Thurlow Weed and Weed's protege, William H. Seward. Through his career, Fillmore decried slavery as an evil, but one beyond the powers of the federal government. Whereas Seward was not only openly hostile to slavery, he argued that the federal government had a role to play in ending it. Fillmore was an unsuccessful candidate for Speaker of the House when the Whigs took control of the chamber in 1841, but was made Ways and Means Committee chairman, defeated in bids for the Whig nomination for Vice President in 1844, and for New York Governor the same year. Fillmore was elected Controller of New York in 1847, the first to hold that post by direct election. Fillmore received the Whig vice presidential nomination in 1848 as Taylor's running mate, and the two were elected. He was largely ignored by Taylor, including the dispensing of patronage in New York, on which Taylor consulted Weed and Seward. As vice president, Fillmore presided over angry debates in the Senate as Congress decided whether to allow slavery in the Mexican session, Fillmore supported Henry Clay's omnibus bill, the basis of the 1850 Compromise, though Taylor did not. After President Taylor died in July 1850, Fillmore dismissed the cabinet and changed the administration's policy. The new president exerted pressure to gain the passage of the Compromise, which gave legislative victories to both North and South, and which was enacted by September the Fugitive Slave Act, expediting the return of escaped slaves to those who claimed ownership, was a controversial part of the compromise, and Fillmore felt himself duty-bound to enforce it, though it damaged his popularity and also the Whig Party, which was torn north from south. In foreign policy, Fillmore supported U.S. Navy expeditions to open trade in Japan, opposed French designs on Hawaii, and was embarrassed by Narciso Lopez's filibuster expeditions to Cuba. He sought election to a full term in 1852, but was passed over by the Whigs in favor of Winfield Scott. As the Whig party broke up after Fillmore's presidency, many of Fillmore's conservative wing joined the Know Nothings, forming the American Party. In his 1856 candidacy as that party's nominee, Fillmore had little to say about immigration, instead focusing on the preservation of the Union, and won only Maryland. In his retirement, Fillmore was active in many civic endeavors. He helped to found the University of Buffalo, serving as its first chancellor. During the American Civil War, Fillmore denounced secession and agreed that the Union must be maintained by force if necessary but was critical of the war policies of Abraham Lincoln. After peace was restored, he supported the reconstruction policies of President Andrew Johnson. Obscure today, Fillmore has been praised by some for his foreign policy, but he is criticized by others for his enforcement of the Fugitive Slave Act and for his association with the Know Nothings. Early Life and Career
Millard Fillmore was born in a log cabin. Nathaniel Fillmore was the son of Nathaniel Fillmore Sr., a native of Franklin, Connecticut who became one of the earliest settlers of Bennington when it was founded in the territory then called the New Hampshire Grants. Nathaniel Fillmore and Phoebe Millard moved from Vermont in 1799, seeking better opportunities than were available on Nathaniel's stony farm. But the title to their Cayuga County land proved defective, and the Fillmore family moved to nearby Sempronius, where they leased the land as tenant farmers, and Nathaniel occasionally taught school. Over time, Nathaniel Fillmore became more successful in Sempronius, but during Millard Fillmore's formative years the family experienced severe poverty. Eventually Nathaniel Fillmore became highly enough regarded that he was chosen to serve in local offices including Justice of the Peace. Later in 1819, Nathaniel moved the family to Montville, a hamlet of Moravia. In 1821, Fillmore turned 21 and was thus legally independent of his father. Buffalo Politician Members of the Fillmore family were active in politics and government. Millard Fillmore's grandfather, Nathaniel Fillmore Sr., served in local offices in Bennington including Hayward, highway surveyor, and tax collector. Many anti-Masons were opposed to the presidential candidacy of General Andrew Jackson, a Mason, and Fillmore was a delegate to a New York convention that endorsed President John Quincy Adams for re-election, as well as serving at two anti-Masonic conventions in the summer of 1828. Fillmore also experienced success as a lawyer. Buffalo was then in a period of rapid expansion, recovering from being burned by the British during the War of 1812 to becoming the western terminus of the Erie Canal. Cases from outside Erie County were already falling to Fillmore's lot, and he was prominent as a lawyer in Buffalo even before he moved there. He took Nathan K. Hall as a law clerk in East Aurora, a lifelong friend. Hall would be Fillmore's partner in Buffalo and his postmaster general as president. Buffalo had been legally a village when Fillmore came there. Although the bill to incorporate it as a city passed the legislature after Fillmore had left the assembly, he helped draw up the city charter. In addition to his successful legal practice, Fillmore helped found the Buffalo High School Association, joined the Lyceum and attended the local Unitarian Church. He became one of the leading citizens of Buffalo. Congressman First term, return to Buffalo Although Fillmore had retired from the legislature after the 1831 session, he did not remain absent from politics for long. In 1832, he ran for the House of Representatives and was elected the anti-Masonic presidential candidate. Former Attorney General William Wirt won only Vermont as President Jackson easily gained re-election. At the time, Congress convened its annual session in December, and so Fillmore had to wait more than a year after his election to take his seat. Fillmore, Weed, and others had realized that opposition to Masonry was too narrow a foundation on which to build a national party, and assembled the broad-based Whig party from national Republicans, anti-Masons, and disaffected Democrats. The Whigs were initially united by their opposition to Jackson, but became a major party by expanding their platform to include support for economic growth. Through rechartering the Second Bank of the United States and federally funded internal improvements including roads, bridges, and canals. In Washington, Fillmore urged the expansion of Buffalo Harbor, a decision under federal jurisdiction, and in his private capacity served on a committee lobbying Albany for the expansion of the state-owned Erie Canal. Anti-Masonry was still strong in western New York though it was petering out nationally, and when the anti-Masons did not nominate him for a second term in 1834, Fillmore declined the Whig nomination, seeing that the two parties would split the anti-Jackson vote and elect the Democrat. Despite Fillmore's departure from office, 
He was a rival for state party leadership with Seward, the unsuccessful 1834 Whig gubernatorial candidate, second through fourth terms. Van Buren, faced with the economic panic of 1837, caused in part by lack of confidence in private banknote issues after Jackson had instructed the government to only accept gold or silver, called its special session of Congress. Government money had been held in so-called pet banks since Jackson had withdrawn it from the second bank. Van Buren proposed to place funds in sub-treasuries, government depositories that would not lend money, believing that government funds should be lent to develop the country. Fillmore felt this would lock the nation's limited supply of gold money away from commerce. Van Buren's sub-treasury and other economic proposals passed, but his hard times continued. The Whigs saw an increased vote in the 1837 elections, and captured the New York Assembly. This set up a fight for the 1838 gubernatorial nomination. Fillmore supported the leading Whig vice presidential candidate from 1836, Francis Granger. Weed preferred Seward. Fillmore was embittered when Weed got the nomination for Seward, but campaigned loyally. Seward was elected, while Fillmore won another term in the House. The rivalry between Fillmore and Seward was affected by the growing anti-slavery movement. Although Fillmore disliked slavery, he saw no reason it should be a political issue. Seward, on the other hand, was hostile to slavery and made that clear in his actions as governor, refusing to return slaves claimed by Southerners. Fillmore was active in the discussions of presidential candidates that preceded the Whig National Convention for the 1840 race. He initially supported General Winfield Scott, but really wanted to defeat Kentucky Senator Henry Clay, a slaveholder he felt could not carry New York State. Fillmore did not attend the convention, but was gratified when it nominated General William Henry Harrison for president, with former Virginia Senator John Tyler his running mate. At the urging of Senator Clay, Harrison quickly called a special session of Congress, with the Whigs to organize the House for the first time. Fillmore sought the speakership, but it went to a Clay acolyte, John White of Kentucky. Fillmore received praise for the tariff, but in July 1842 he announced he would not seek re-election. The Whigs nominated him anyway, but he refused it. Tired of Washington life and the conflict that had revolved around President Tyler, Fillmore sought to return to his life and law practice in Buffalo. Fillmore continued to be active in the lame duck session of Congress that followed the 1842 elections and returned to Buffalo in April 1843. According to his biographer, Scary, Fillmore concluded his congressional career at a point when he had become a powerful figure, an able statesman at the height of his popularity. National Figure Out of Office Fillmore continued his law practice and made long-neglected repairs to his Buffalo home. He remained a major political figure, leading the Committee of Notables that welcomed John Quincy Adams to Buffalo, and the former president expressed his regret at Fillmore's absence from the halls of Congress. Some urged Fillmore to run for vice president with Clay, the consensus Whig choice for president in 1844. Horace Greeley wrote privately that, My own first choice has long been Millard Fillmore. Others thought Fillmore should try to win back the governor's mansion for the Whigs. Fillmore hoped to gain the endorsement of the New York delegation to the National Convention, but Weed wanted the vice presidency for Seward. With Fillmore as governor, Seward, however, withdrew prior to the 1844 Whig National Convention. When Weed's replacement vice presidential hopeful, Willis Hall, fell ill, Weed sought to defeat Fillmore's candidacy to force him to run for governor. Weed's attempts to boost Fillmore as a gubernatorial candidate caused the former congressman to write, I am not willing to be treacherously killed by this pretended kindness.
Do not suppose for a minute that I think they desire my nomination for governor. Quote. Putting a good face on his defeat, Fillmore met and publicly appeared with Frelinghuysen, quietly spurning Weed's offer to get him nominated as governor at the state convention. Fillmore's position in opposing slavery, but feeling the government lacked power to abolish it, made him acceptable as a statewide Whig candidate, and Weed saw to it the pressure on Fillmore increased. Fillmore had previously stated that a convention had the right to draft anyone for political service, and Weed got the convention to choose Fillmore, who had broad support despite his reluctance. The Democrats nominated Senator Silas Wright as their gubernatorial candidate, and former Tennessee Governor James K. Polk for president, although Fillmore worked to gain support among German Americans, a major constituency. He was hurt among immigrants by the fact that New York City Whigs had supported a nativist candidate in the mayoral election earlier in 1844. Fillmore and his party were tarred with that brush. In 1846, Fillmore was involved in the founding of the University of Buffalo, and became its first chancellor. He served until his death in 1874. He had opposed the annexation of Texas, and spoke against the subsequent Mexican-American War, seeing it as a contrivance to extend slavery's realm. Fillmore was angered when President Polk vetoed a river and harbors bill that would have benefited Buffalo. Before moving to Albany to take office on January 1, 1848, he left his law firm and rented his house. Fillmore received positive reviews for his service as controller. In that office, he was a member of the State Canal Board, and both supported expansion and saw to it that it was managed competently. He secured an enlargement of Buffalo's canal facilities. The controller regulated the banks, and Fillmore stabilized the currency by requiring that state chartered banks keep New York and federal bonds to the value of the bank notes they issued. A similar plan would be adopted by Congress in 1864. Election of 1848 Nomination For further information on the procedures of American political conventions, see United States Presidential Nominating Convention. President Polk had pledged not to seek a second term, and with the gains in Congress during the 1846 election cycle, the Whigs were hopeful of taking the White House in 1848. The party's perennial candidates, Henry Clay and Daniel Webster, each wanted the nomination, and amassed support from congressional colleagues. Many rank-and-file Whigs backed the Mexican War hero, General Zachary Taylor, for president. Although Taylor was extremely popular, many Northerners had qualms about electing a Louisiana slaveholder at a time of sectional tension over whether slavery should be allowed in the territories ceded by Mexico. Taylor's uncertain political views gave others pause. Career Army He had never cast a ballot for president though he stated that he was a Whig supporter, and some feared they might elect another Tyler, or another Harrison. With the nomination undecided, Weed maneuvered for New York to send an uncommitted delegation to the 1848 Whig National Convention in Philadelphia, hoping to be a kingmaker in position to place former Governor Seward on the ticket, or to get him high national office. He persuaded Fillmore to support an uncommitted ticket. Though he did not tell the Buffalone of his hopes for Seward, Weed was an influential editor, and Fillmore tended to cooperate with him for the greater good of the Whig party. But Weed had sterner opponents, including Governor Young, who disliked Seward and did not want to see him gain high office. Despite Weed's efforts, Taylor was nominated on the fourth ballot, to the anger of Clay's supporters and of conscience Whigs from the Northeast. When order was restored, John A. Collier, a New Yorker and a weed opponent, addressed the convention. Delegates hung on his every word as he described himself as a clay partisan. He had voted for clay on each ballot. He eloquently described the grief of the clay supporters, 
frustrated again in their battle to make Clay president. Collier warned of a fatal breach in the party, and stated that only one thing could prevent it, the nomination of Fillmore for vice president, whom he incorrectly depicted as a strong Clay supporter. Fillmore in fact agreed with many of Clay's positions, but did not back him for president and was not in Philadelphia. Delegates did not know this was false, or at least greatly exaggerated, and there was a large reaction in Fillmore's favor. At the time, the presidential candidate did not automatically pick his running mate, and despite the efforts of Taylor's managers to get the nomination for their choice, Abbott Lawrence of Massachusetts, Fillmore became the Whig nominee for vice president on the second ballot. Weed had wanted the vice presidential nomination for Seward, who attracted few delegate votes, and Collier had acted to frustrate them in more ways than one. For with the New Yorker Fillmore as vice president, under the political customs of the time, no one from that state could be named to the cabinet. Fillmore was accused of complicity in Collier's actions, but this was never substantiated. General Election Campaign it was customary in mid-19th century America for a candidate for high office not to appear to seek it. Thus, Fillmore remained at the Comptroller's office in Albany, and made no speeches. The 1848 campaign was conducted in the newspapers and with addresses made by surrogates at rallies. The Democrats nominated Michigan Senator Lewis Cass for president, with General William O. Butler his running mate but it would be a three-way fight as the Free Soil Party, opposed to the spread of slavery, chose former President Van Buren. Northerners assumed that Fillmore, hailing from a free state, was an opponent of the spread of slavery. Southerners accused him of being an abolitionist, which he hotly denied. In the end, the Taylor-Fillmore ticket won narrowly, with New York's electoral votes again key to the election. Vice President Millard Fillmore was sworn in as Vice President on March 5, 1849, in the Senate Chamber, as March 4, then the usual inauguration day, fell on a Sunday. The swearing-in was postponed until the following day. Fillmore took the oath from Chief Justice Roger B. Taney and in turn swore in the Senators beginning their terms, including Seward who in February had been elected by the New York legislature. Fillmore had spent the four months between the election and swearing and being faded by the New York Whigs and winding up affairs in the Comptroller's office. Taylor had written promising influence in the new administration, but the president-elect mistakenly thought that the vice president was a cabinet member, which was not true in the 19th century. Fillmore Seward and Weed had met and come to general agreement on how to divide federal jobs in New York. Seward, once he went to Washington, made friendly contact with Taylor's cabinet nominees, advisors, and the general's brother, and an alliance between the incoming administration and the Weed machine was soon underway behind Fillmore's back. In exchange for support, Seward and Weed were allowed to designate who would fill federal jobs in New York, with Fillmore given far less than had been agreed. When Fillmore, after the inauguration, discovered this, he went to Taylor, but the only result was that the warfare against Fillmore's influence became open. Fillmore supporters like Collier, who had nominated him at the convention, were passed over for candidates backed by Weed who was triumphant even in Buffalo. This greatly increased the influence of weed in New York politics, and diminished Fillmore's. According to Rayback, by mid-1849, Fillmore's situation had become desperate. Quote, Through 1849, the status of slavery in the territories remained unresolved. Taylor advocated the admission of California and of New Mexico. From a Peter F. Rothermel engraving, Vice President Fillmore, upper right, presides over the compromise debates as Henry Clay takes the floor of the old Senate chamber. John C. Calhoun, seen in part standing just to Fillmore's right, and Daniel Webster, 
seated to the left of Clay. Look on. Fillmore fought back against Weed by building a network of like-minded Whigs in New York State. With their positions publicized by the establishment of a rival newspaper to Weed's Albany Evening Journal, this was backed by wealthy New Yorkers. All pretense at friendship between Fillmore and Weed vanished in November 1849, when the two happened to meet in New York City, and they exchanged accusations. Fillmore presided. Presidency Succession amid crisis July 4, 1850 was a very hot day in Washington, and President Taylor, who attended Fourth of July ceremonies, refreshed himself, likely with cold milk and cherries. What he consumed probably gave him gastroenteritis, and he died on July 9. Taylor, nicknamed Old Rough and Ready, had gained a reputation for toughness through his military campaigning in the heat and his sudden death came as a shock to the nation. Fillmore had been called from his chair presiding over the Senate on July 8, and had sat with members of the cabinet in a vigil outside Taylor's bedroom at the White House. He received the formal notification of the president's death, signed by the cabinet, on the evening of July 9 in his residence at the Willard Hotel. After acknowledging the letter, and spending a sleepless night, the brief pause from politics out of national grief at Taylor's death did not abate the crisis. Texas had attempted to assert its authority in New Mexico Territory, and the state's governor, Peter H. Bell, had sent belligerent letters to President Taylor. Fillmore sent a special message to Congress on August 6, 1850, disclosing the letter from Governor Bell and his reply warning that armed Texans would be viewed as intruders, and urging Congress to defuse sectional tensions by passing the compromise. Without the great triumvirate of John C. Calhoun, Webster and Clay who had long dominated the Senate. Domestic Affairs The Fugitive Slave Act continued to be contentious after its enactment. Southerners complained bitterly about any slackness but enforcement was highly offensive to many Northerners. Abolitionists recited the inequities of the law. It punished severely any aid to an escaped slave, and if captured, he had no due process and could not testify before a magistrate who would be paid more for deciding he was a slave than for deciding he was not. Nevertheless, Fillmore believed himself bound by his oath as president and by the bargain made in the Compromise to enforce the Fugitive Slave Act. He did so even though some prosecutions or attempts to return slaves ended badly for the government, with acquittals or the slave taken from federal custody into freedom by a Boston mob. Such cases were widely publicized north and south, and inflamed passions in both places, undermining the good feeling that had followed the compromise. In August 1850, the social reformer Dorothea Dix wrote to Fillmore, urging support for her proposal in Congress for land grants to finance asylums for the impoverished mentally ill. Though her proposal did not pass, they became friends, meeting in person and corresponding, continuing well after Fillmore's presidency. A longtime supporter of national infrastructure development, Fillmore signed bills to subsidize the Illinois Central Railroad from Chicago to Mobile, and for a canal at Sault Ste. Marie. The 1851 completion of the Erie Railroad in New York prompted Fillmore and his cabinet to ride the first train from New York City to the shores of Lake Erie, in company with many other politicians and dignitaries. Fillmore made many speeches along the way from the train's rear platform urging acceptance of the compromise, and afterwards went on a tour of New England with his Southern cabinet members. Although Fillmore urged Congress to authorize a transcontinental railroad, it did not do so until a decade later. Fillmore appointed one justice to the Supreme Court of the United States, and made four appointments to United States District Courts, including that of his law partner and cabinet officer. Nathan Hall, to the Federal District Court in Buffalo, 
Justice John McKinley's death in 1852 led to repeated, fruitless attempts by the president to fill the vacancy. The Senate took no action on the nomination of New Orleans attorney Edward A. Bradford, Fillmore's second choice, George Edmund Badger, asked that his name be withdrawn. Senator-elect Judy P. Benjamin declined to serve. The nomination of William C. Migu, a New Orleans lawyer recommended by Benjamin, was not acted on by the Senate. The vacancy was finally filled after Fillmore's term, when President Franklin Pierce nominated John Archibald Campbell, who was confirmed by the Senate. Foreign Relations Fillmore oversaw two highly competent secretaries of state, Daniel Webster, and after the New Englanders 1852 death, Edward Everett, looking over their shoulders and making all major decisions. Fillmore was a staunch opponent of European influence in Hawaii. France under Napoleon III sought to annex Hawaii, but backed down after Fillmore issued a strongly worded message warning that the United States would not stand for any such action. Quote, Fillmore had difficulties regarding Cuba. Many Southerners hoped to see the island part of the U.S. as slave territory. Cuba was a colony of Spain where slavery was practiced. A much-publicized event of Fillmore's presidency was the arrival in late 1851 of Lajos Kossuth, the exiled leader of a failed Hungarian revolution against Austria. Kossuth wanted the U.S to recognize Hungary's independence. Many Americans were sympathetic to the Hungarian rebels, especially recent German immigrants, who were now coming to the U.S. in large numbers and had become a major political force. Kossuth was fated by Congress, and Fillmore allowed a White House meeting after receiving word that Kossuth would not try to politicize it, in spite of his promise. Kossuth made a speech promoting his cause. The American enthusiasm for Kossuth petered out, and he departed for Europe. Fillmore refused to change American policy, remaining neutral. Election of 1852 and completion of term As the election of 1852 approached, Fillmore remained undecided whether to run for a full term as president. Secretary Webster had long coveted the presidency and, though past 70, planned a final attempt to gain the White House. Fillmore was sympathetic to the ambitions of his longtime friend, but though he issued a letter in late 1851 stating that he did not seek a full term, was reluctant to rule it out, fearing the party would be captured by the Sewardites. Thus, approaching the National Convention in Baltimore, to be held in June 1852. The major candidates were Fillmore, Webster and General Scott, Weed and Seward Beck Scott. In late May, the Democrats nominated former New Hampshire Senator Franklin Pierce, who had been out of national politics for nearly a decade before 1852, but whose profile had risen as a result of his military service in the Mexican War. The nomination of Pierce, a northerner sympathetic to the southern view on slavery, united the Democrats and meant the Whig candidate would face an uphill battle to gain the presidency. Fillmore was by then unpopular with northern Whigs for signing and enforcing the Fugitive Slave Act, but had considerable support from the South, where he was seen as the only candidate capable of uniting the party. Once the convention passed a party platform endorsing the compromise as a final settlement of the slavery question, Fillmore was willing to withdraw, but found that many of his supporters could not accept Webster and his action would nominate Scott. The convention deadlocked, and this persisted through Saturday, June 19, when a total of 46 ballots had been taken. Delegates adjourned until Monday. Party leaders proposed a deal to both Fillmore and Webster. If the secretary could increase his vote total over the next several ballots, enough Fillmore supporters would go along to put him over the top. If he could not, Webster would withdraw in favor of Fillmore. The president quickly agreed, but Webster did not do so until Monday morning.
On the 48th ballot, Webster delegates began to defect to Scott, and the general gained the nomination on the 53rd ballot. Webster was far more unhappy at the outcome than was Fillmore, who refused the secretary's resignation, bereft of the votes of much of the South and also of Northerners who depended on peaceful intersectional trade. Scott was easily beaten by Pierce in November. Smith suggested that the Whigs might have done much better with Fillmore. The final months of Fillmore's term were uneventful. Webster died in October 1852, but during the final illness, Fillmore effectively acted as his own Secretary of State without incident and Everett stepped competently into Webster's shoes. Fillmore intended to lecture Congress on the slavery question in his final annual message in December, but was talked out of it by his cabinet, and he contented himself with pointing out the prosperity of the nation and expressing gratitude for the opportunity to serve it. There was little discussion of slavery during the lame duck session of Congress, and Fillmore left office on March 4, 1853, succeeded by Pierce. Post-Presidency Tragedy and Political Turmoil Fillmore was the first president to return to private life without being independently wealthy or in possession of a landed estate, and, with no pension to anticipate, was unsure how he would make a living consistent with the dignity of his former office. His friend, Judge Hall, assured him that it would be proper for him to practice law in the higher courts of New York, and Fillmore intended to do so. The former president ended his seclusion in early 1854, as debate over Senator Douglas Kansas' Nebraska bill embroiled the nation. This would open the northern portion of the Louisiana Purchase to settlement, including slavery and would end the northern limit on slavery under the Missouri Compromise of 1820. Fillmore decided on an ostensibly non-political national tour, hoping to rally disaffected Whig politicians to preserve the Union and back a run for president, for he retained many supporters. This occupied much of the late winter and spring of 1854. Fillmore made public appearances opening railroads and visiting the grave of Senator Clay but met behind the scenes with politicians. Such a comeback could not be under the auspices of the Whig Party, with its remnants divided by the Kansas-Nebraska legislation, which passed with the support of Pierce. Many northern foes of slavery, such as Seward, gravitated towards a new party, the Republicans, but Fillmore saw no home for himself there. There was in the early 1850s considerable hostility towards immigrants, especially Catholics, who had recently arrived in the United States in large numbers, and several nativist organizations, including the Order of the Star-Spangled Banner, sprang up in response. By 1854, the order had morphed into the American Party, which became known as the Know-Nothings, for in its early days, Members were sworn to hold private its internal deliberations, and if asked were to say they knew nothing about them. Later that year, Fillmore went abroad, stating publicly that as he lacked office, he might as well travel. The trip was at the advice of political friends, who felt that by touring, he would avoid involvement in the contentious issues of the day, and he spent over a year from March 1855 to June 1856, in Europe and the Middle East. Queen Victoria is said to have pronounced the ex-president the handsomest man she had ever seen, while his presence in the gallery of the House of Commons at the same time as Van Buren excited a comment from MP John Bright. Dorothea Dix had preceded him to Europe, and was lobbying to improve conditions for the mentally ill. They continued to correspond, and met several times. 1856 Campaign Fillmore's allies were in full control of the American Party, and they arranged for him to get its presidential nomination while he was in Europe. As Fillmore's running mate, the Know Nothing Convention chose Andrew Jackson Don Ilson of Kentucky, nephew by marriage and one-time ward of President Jackson.
Fillmore returned in June 1856, arriving to a huge reception in New York City. He progressed across the state to Buffalo, speaking at a series of welcomes. These addresses were ostensibly in thanks for his reception, and so did not violate the custom that it was considered office seeking for a presidential hopeful to make campaign speeches. Fillmore warned that electing the Republican candidate, former California Senator John C. Fremont, who had no support in the South, would divide the Union and lead to civil war. Both Fillmore and the Democratic candidate, former Pennsylvania Senator James Buchanan, agreed that slavery was principally a matter for state and not federal government. Fillmore rarely spoke about the immigration question, and focused on the sectional divide, urging preservation of the Union. Once Fillmore was back home in Buffalo, he had no excuse to make speeches, and his campaign stagnated through the summer and fall of 1856. Political fixers who had been Whigs, such as Weed, tended to join the Republican Party, and the know-nothings lacked experience at selling anything but nativism. Accordingly, Fillmore's pro-union stance mostly went unheard. Although the South was friendly towards Fillmore, many there feared a Fremont victory would lead to secession, and some sympathetic to Fillmore moved into the Buchanan camp lest the anti-Fremont vote be split, which might elect the Republican. On election day, Buchanan won with 1.836.072 votes and 174 electoral votes to Fremont's 1.342. 345 votes and 114 electoral votes. Fillmore and Donelson finished third, winning 873.053 votes and carrying the state of Maryland in its eight electoral votes. Historian Alan Evans wrote that Fillmore was not a know-nothing or a nativist. He was out of the country when the nomination came and had not been consulted about running. Furthermore, by no spoken or written word had he indicated a subscription to American tenets. Quote, Later Life and Death With his defeat in 1856, Fillmore deemed his political career at an end. He again felt inhibited from returning to the practice of law, but his financial worries were removed when on February 10, 1858, Fillmore married Caroline McIntosh, the wealthy widow, their combined wealth allowed them to purchase a large house on Niagara Square in Buffalo, where they lived for the remainder of Millard Fillmore's life. In the election of 1860, Fillmore voted for Senator Douglas, the nominee of the Northern Democrats. After the vote, in which the Republican candidate, former Illinois Representative Abraham Lincoln was elected, Many sought out Fillmore's views but he refused to take any part in the secession crisis that followed, feeling that he lacked influence. Despite Fillmore's zeal in the war effort, he was attacked in many newspapers when he gave a speech in early 1864 calling for magnanimity towards the South at war's end, and counting the heavy cost, financial and in blood, of the war. The Lincoln administration saw this as an attack on it, that could not be tolerated in an election year, and Fillmore was called a copperhead and even a traitor. This led to lasting ill feeling against Fillmore in many circles. After Lincoln's assassination in April 1865, black ink was thrown on Fillmore's house as it was not draped in mourning like others. Though he was apparently out of town at the time and put black drapes in the windows once he returned, although he retained his position as Buffalo's leading citizen and was among those selected to escort the body when Lincoln's funeral train passed through Buffalo, there was still anger against him for his wartime positions. Fillmore stayed in good health almost to the end, but suffered a stroke in February 1874 and died after a second one on March 8. Two days later, he was buried at Forest Lawn Cemetery in Buffalo after a funeral procession of hundreds of notables. Legacy and Historical View According to his biographer, Scary, no president of the United States, 
has suffered as much ridicule as Millard Fillmore. Although Fillmore has become something of a cult figure as America's most forgettable chief executive, Smith found him to be a conscientious president who chose to honor his oath of office and enforce the Fugitive Slave Act, rather than govern based on his personal preferences. Benson Lee Grayson suggested that the Fillmore administration's ability to avoid potential problems is too often overlooked. Fillmore's constant attention to Mexico avoided a resumption of the war and laid the groundwork for the Gadsden Treaty during Pierce's presidency. Millard Fillmore, with his wife Abigail, established the first White House library. Any assessment of a president who served a century and a half ago must be refracted through a consideration of the interesting times in which he lived. Fillmore's political career encompassed the tortuous course toward the two-party system that we know today. The Whigs were not cohesive enough to survive the slavery embroglio, while parties like the Anti-Masonics and Know-Nothings were too extremist. When, as president, Fillmore sided with pro-slavery elements in ordering enforcement of the Fugitive Slave Law, he all but guaranteed that he would be the last Whig president. The first modern two-party system of Whigs and Democrats had succeeded only in dividing the nation in two by the 1850s. And seven years later, the election of the first Republican president, Abraham Lincoln, would guarantee civil war. Memorial plaques